Welcome. Uh, grab your seats. Sip your coffees. Welcome to AIMCON day one. Uh, anybody just getting here right now, or have we all been learning all morning? I think we've all been learning all morning. Great. Uh, let's give a big hand to our organizers, uh, Isis Graham, Andrew Williams, Matt Carter, the volunteer team, and everyone, everyone who's put this wonderful event together. It already looks, I was at the one in, Ed, anyone at the one in Edmonton last year? Yep, totally. Uh, it's already looking twice the, sta twice the size of what uh, I remember from last year. So good for you for being here and investing in your career as well. Uh, my name is Joel West. I'm from Vancouver. I run an organization called Groundwork, which is a monthly meetup for electronic music producers. Uh, we're also a small label, and we run showcase events supporting Vancouver talent. That's me. You can look us up at groundworkvancouver.com. W-E-R-K, like craft work. Uh, and you are here today to learn about managing a festival or a large-scale event. So before they even introduce themselves, can we please get a big hand for our wonderful panelists? <laughs> And now we have a warm room. Um, good, so if you don't mind, can we very quickly uh, just say who we are, what our festival or organization is, and how long that organization or festival has been running. And we'll just start here and barrel down the line. Hey everyone, I'm Baron Faber, uh, co-founder of Base Bus. Uh, Base Bus has been around for six years. Um, I'm here kind of repping Circle, which is a festival we've been running for four years. Thanks for the bus rides last night. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Anybody on the base bus this weekend? Yeah. Woo! Um, my name's Andrea Graham, and I'm the co-founder of Base Coast Festival, which is heading into our 10th year this year. <laughs> Woo! Who's been to Base Coast? Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole Seaboyer. I'm the director of human resources at Shambhala Music Festival. Um, this is going to be our 21st year. What? I'm uh, Jordan Smolniak, director and founder of Astro Harvest, and we just finished our 10th year. Yeah. Congrats. Hi, I'm Moot Salvi. I'm the executive director of Sled Island, uh, which has been around for 12 years now. Congratulations. Um, I want to get this question out of the way because a lot of people here are, how many uh, producers and or DJs in the room? Yeah, right. How many people attend festivals? How many people play festivals? How many people would like to play more festivals? Yeah, okay, great. So let's just get this conversation like lightning fast. How do people apply? When does that happen? Uh, and just get that right over with. Like, what are the dates? What do you send in? When do you do that? Let's just get that right out of the way and then we can move on to the really fun stuff uh, going down the line. Oh, you're not with me. Okay. <laughs> um, we're a one-day festival. Um, we typically curate the music uh, quite from scratch internally, um, but we do open submissions to everyone just online through our website. Um, I totally encourage anyone who is interested to apply. We go through every submission, um, and as we grow, the, the amount of uh, spaces we have continues to grow, too. And w is there a, a time limit or window for submission? Not right now. Perfect. Open window right here. <laughs> um, for Base Coast, we curate through submissions, but also through people that we search out. Our submissions open through our website December 1st to December 10th. Um, we generally sort of, we, we find the mix, or it's most successful if you just submit the links that we were asked for. We don't need a whole bunch of custom content. It's just to the point, and um, we will contact you if successful. <laughs> uh, for Shambhala, we actually don't accept submissions, so um, we, we're kind of unique because we don't have one talent buyer, we have six, um, and they all curate their own stages, so they all uh, reach out to the people that they that they want. So um, if you really want to play on their stages, the best thing to do is get their attention. So keep doing what you're doing and making making them notice you basically is, is the best thing we can say. And often we do get submissions that come in, but basically our kind of email back is, you know, if you want to get in there, meet people and get your foot in the door, come try volunteering or being on the crew. You know, you can kind of get a scene, see what who everyone is and who you need to talk to and kind of go from there. So that's kind of the best advice we can give than just work hard and, and get their attention. Uh, for Astro Harvest, 
we open applications in January and we usually do it for about 30 days unless we just know that we're not going to take any more. And uh, some of the keys to getting booked, I suppose, would be like what Andrea said, just give what's necessary. Don't give a bunch of fluff and definitely don't private message anyone. Uh, that won't get you anywhere. No Facebook messages. They're not going to be responded to. Um, yeah, that's basically how we do it. Uh, for Sled Island, it's kind of like Facebook's part of the lineup is curated directly, but then we also have a submission process. Uh, submissions are already open. They will be until mid to end of February. There's a form online on our website with exactly what we require, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we get about a thousand submissions per year, and we are able to select about a hundred artists out of that. Great, thank you for being really concise in that. Uh, we get that one out of the way. Um, you're the only people in your organization, right? Like the people here, you run base codes, you run surf, like it doesn't take a team. It's just you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. That's what I thought. So how many, um, let's look at like core staff or like is everyone here, I'm gonna imagine we're at a level that the answer might be yes, but maybe not. Um, do you have a paid year round staff or, or most of the year staff? Is there a core team that is working on your festival or event year round. And how many people is that? How many people does it take? Well, we're working on quite a few events year round. So we do have full-time staff uh, that are working on each of the events. So Circle does have full-time staff. I'm working on it year round. Uh, our marketing manager, social media manager, finance, uh, talent buyers, things like that. Um, so yeah, quick answer. We have paid staff year round. Um, closer to the festival, that core crew starts to get tighter and closer and starts to grow and build, um, you know, from six to 12 to kind of the months, weeks leading out can grow to kind of 25 plus. How many were you when you started out? Three. But like mostly one. <laughs> And you, Andrea? How big is the team? Uh, we have three full-time year-round staff, including myself and Liz, the co-founder. Um, and then we have five more part-time year-round. And then, as Baron said, you know, six months prior to the festival, that team starts to increase. And then three months prior again, and then by two weeks prior, it's it's all hands on deck, and we have at that point, you know, a paid staff of around 100, and then the suppliers and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. I think we were at around 600 volunteers last year. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nicole, how big is Shambhala team? Uh, well, we do have a year-round staff of about 20, um, mostly full-time. That includes the six stage directors. Uh, we have an office in Nelson where about 10, 10-ish of us work year-round. Um, and then pretty much that goes until the new year and we start bringing in new managers and supervisors um, as the time goes on to help with the hiring. Um, and it just keeps ballooning all the way until the festival comes. Um, and at the festival we have 2,600 crew um, and that includes volunteers, staff, and contractors. So we have a pretty big team of, of help. We need them. <laughs> Astro Harvest doesn't currently have full-time staff. We do have um, a team of 12 that is part of the core, core crew. Um, it's a very diverse and passionate group. Um, we actually are all pretty close friends as well. And as we get closer to the event, everybody's workload increases, but um, I don't think there's enough uh, year-round work to keep everybody sustained full-time. Uh, we can see if that changes in the future. Uh, we're a small team of three full-time year-round as well, myself included, uh, and same as uh, my colleagues here. About three, four months before, we start having like a few contractors for a few months, and then during the festival, it's probably upwards of... 50 people, including all the techs, etc., and people who work just for the week. Uh, and we have about between 400 and 450 volunteers each year as well. Wow. Big teams to manage. Uh, volunteer coordinator, a very important position. Yeah, okay. Uh, Vicky is an incredible... 
Actually, can we give a hand to Vicky, our volunteer coordinator here, for running a lot of things this weekend? She works in HR, too, at Chambala. Right. She's, she is uh, all over the she's place. A she works, works for Astro Harvest as well. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who doesn't she work for? Um, very skilled. Um, real, as as uh, We have a lot of stuff to get through, and uh, I, I'm going to seem like I'm rushing. I've also had a lot of caffeine. I want to pack as much value into an hour with five people as we can. So if I am rushing, you can tell me to slow down. Um, what I wanted to ask was, what's the hierarchy? Is it is it a decision making and planning? Is there is there a is there a hierarchy? Is it a communal thing? Do you sit around and have food and talk about the year? How does this work uh, within your organization? Um, well, we have there's three partners with Circle uh, Base Bus kind of produces it, and we have YYC Food Trucks and Village Brewery, who are the co-founders of those two organizations, came together with the idea to create this festival. Um, so we get together maybe just a few times a year just to kind of sit down and have big brainstorm sessions and just brain dumps and what worked last year, what kind of new ideas and crazy things we want to add. Um, and then, and then I kind of, my role is to kind of develop that vision, create that vision, bring it to life and kind of engage our team and the people that we work with and kind of, and get everybody's ideas and throw them in the pot and, there's no better way to kind of bring ideas to life than to just get your friends in a room and, and just start shooting the shit and have some beers. And uh, that's a huge kind of powerful thing. And then you step back and bring those visions to life. And that's kind of where I have the most fun and <laughs> it takes the most work. But bringing vision to life, because ideas are one thing, but making it happen is another. But. So it sounds fairly organic, but like hand on the tiller, to use a ship metaphor, yeah? Okay, like literally. <laughs> All right. <laughs> How do things work at Base Coast? Um, similarly, it, it started as such a small team that Liz and I really strive just to be autonomous in, in any like big decisions. We had to be both on, on the mark with it. So as our team developed, we, we really started to value having more input and, and like Baron, we also have a few sessions a year where everyone gets together because we all work from different cities. And so we are basically communicating through Skype and Google Docs and um, and the phone. And, and to be face to face, that's when people come up with lots of ideas and, and you can kind of throw things out there without having this big commitment behind it. And I find that that's when these creative sparks happen. And so, um, we really strive to hear what our what our core team wants, and then when, with the bigger decisions, we also reach out to people in our community that aren't necessarily part of our team, but whose opinions we really value. Very cool. And Shambhala. How Shambhala. many cooks in the kitchen? Lots. <laughs> um, well, our structure kind of works like Jimmy, who's the owner of the festival, um, who started the festival on his parents' farm when he was a we young boy um, and he you know he's kind of he's the CEO of the company um, he has his right hand man who's our COO um, then it breaks down into the six different departments so there's department heads um, that's pretty much who works in our office so we're the ones that are you know kind of what you would call the executive of the festival the ones that meet and make um, most of the decisions um, and so, and yeah, we have a lot of meetings and um, brainstorming ideas and we're, we do quarterly retreats where we go away somewhere and just so we can jam out and talk about things outside of the office and away from, from our emails. We have to put the phones away and, uh, and just relax and figure out what we need to do and how we're gonna do it and do some bonding and make some s'mores and go to the hot springs and <laughs> you know, um, just so that everybody, you know, it's a good way to like, jam stuff out, you know, we'll have some beers and happy hour and, you know, maybe a mimosa or two and, you know, <laughs> and get the ideas flowing and figure out what we want to do, you know, continuing down the road. It seems like there's a theme of uh, food and, and having fun and kind of letting loose a little bit. Yeah, that might be just me, out. though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sounded like, yeah, I mean, I've been on the base bus. Um, <laughs> how about Astral? Uh, with Astral Harvest, again, uh, as they mentioned, there's a lot of workshops, there's a lot of getting together, tossing ideas around, um, giving opinions, giving perspectives, and 
at the end of the day, we do have, like with the 12 core crew members, uh, most of us have equal, well, we all do have equal s sort of level of um, influence, but, but I am the director and any major final decision does go through me. Um, and then from that point, we have just many more other facets that ideas filter down into whether that's stage crews or coordinators, on-site coordinators, that kind of stuff. So we like to take ideas and really hear everybody's opinion. And if something like further down the line doesn't seem to make sense to somebody, that can come right back up and then it's revisited. I can be convinced to change my mind pretty easily if it makes sense. So, you know, the decisions go through me, but I think that's more of a responsibility thing than a, sure. than a decision-making process. So egalitarian, but yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, if so there's a, a, a deadlock, you'll step in. Absolutely, okay. yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Um, Sled Island is a non-for-profit, so we have a board of directors who technically are my bosses, so they hire me, I hire the rest of the staff. Uh, that being said, they're mostly they're in a role of support, I would say. They're not really hands-on, but any like big picture decision, strategic, financial needs at the end of the day to be approved by them. Um, to make these decisions and present them to them, even though I'm the director, I would say that the two other staff that work uh, with me, I run any decision and we always have conversation together, even though at the end of the day, as you were saying, especially for financial matters, I'm gonna have to make the call, but like we always talk it through, the three of us, if not more people around. Uh, and especially when it comes to programming, I like to think that we have a pretty democratic process. Um, we always ask for suggestions from people we work with, we have like a lot of Google Docs where people, we compile suggestions. Uh, and to review the submission that we get through a website, we have a listening committee that we, is made up of just people from the community who are involved with music. We have uh, CGSW DJs, we have just music fans, other musicians, and we try to have people that kind of represent every sort of style of music to make sure that like, yeah, there's a good representation and diversity in the lineup, so yeah. Especially for programming wise, there's a lot of people involved for sure. Uh, it sounds like we have a theme of like friendships, trust, and uh, no, no one's really uh, a dictator within their, their thing. Everyone is really having a conversation within their organization. Family. Yeah, okay, family, good word, good word. Uh, we answered it with, uh, with Mode, uh, but if it's not impolite to ask, are you, uh, are you a nonprofit? Are you an LLC? Are you a partnership? Are you a sole proprietorship? Are you an ad hoc collective? Uh, is that a question we can uh, nail down for those who are thinking of starting festivals and wondering where they should go? Um, what's your structure there? Um, so currently all of our events run under BaseBus. So we have BaseBus Inc., which is an LLC, but we also have BaseBus Arts Foundation, which is a nonprofit. Um, but as these, we've got a couple major kind of festivals that we've been producing now, and as they grow, we're starting to create their own identities and their own corporations just to kind of keep the books neat and clean and their own thing. What are some of the advantages, very quickly, uh, are there like one or two or three advantages from being a nonprofit, things you have access to? Most yeah. Oh, I was going to say mostly public funding. I think grants are a big part of it. He usually have to be a nonprofit and have been in operating for at least one year to apply to for a lot of grants. And are you getting federal grants, provincial grants? Uh, is it city stuff? Where all, what level all are three you? Levels all three levels of government. What about everyone else? If that's not an impolite question, if it is, you can just go pass. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Base Coast is a is a for profit company. Um, we only received our first grant last year for the first time through the Music BC and uh, Creative BC. So that was really, really nice and kind of allowed us to expand different programs within the company. We also have a nonprofit called Innovate Arts that helps facilitate our art grant program. So that's something that we're looking to develop in the future and see if there's opportunities to receive also grants to help boost that whole program. 
Uh, Shambhala is a limited company for profit. Um, we don't, we have, I don't think we've ever gotten any grants to date, but I like that idea. So <laughs> maybe I'll make some notes and take them home with me. Um, but yeah, we have a parent company. We have a lot of parent companies. Actually, we have like nine companies. So Shambhala is just one of the, but yeah, it's a, it's a blanket. <laughs> Uh, Astro Harvest is a limited company as well, and um, no, we haven't received any grants in the past. We've looked into it, and um, it might be something in the future. When does planning start? How far ahead does that have to start? And is anyone here actually planning, like if you're planning 2018, are you ever planning that before 2017's festival? Like how far ahead do you have to start? Well, I mean, when we started because of the number of events we're running a year. It was first year it was four months out, and it was just like racing the whole time. Um, we're now at a point where the the planning's happening year round. As soon as we're done one year, we're we're getting back together, debriefing and starting to make plans, and the artwork process starts taking place. The other thing with Circle of the Wagons, or sorry, it's Circle now. Um, is that it's a traveling festival, so every year we move to a new location, and uh, that's a big process. That's uh, a huge logistic uh, kind of thing we bet off there. But um, so that's a huge step right away. We're looking for um, you know the next location. We're developing new relationships with new partners, landowners. Uh, whether it's going to be city land or private land, there's a ton of work that goes in there and essentially that's just like this huge roadblock in front of me like I can't do anything until I know I've got my land and location I can't do artwork I can't even think about artists and who we're going to book so that's the thing that lights the fire under my ass find the next location and uh, and then it all starts to unfold but you're, yeah. you're tying in the next question is what are the key green lights through the year like, like if you had like two or three antecedents that have to happen before the next action can be taken you just identified finding your land when does that have to happen Land is as soon as possible, but sometimes that's tough. That's a lot of times we're, we're seeking out different locations, you know, continuously, but when it gets to the actual signed agreement, that is a long process. So it can take three, four months just to do that. Um, so that's number one, huge green light. And then, uh, um, well, artist permits is huge. I mean, the thing with permits, which is so much fun that I learned as a festival organizer is... You can apply for all the permits you want, but you often don't have the stamp of approval until days before or even day of. So many permits. I remember working through this and I was just so blown away. I didn't have approval till the city handed me my package the day of the festival. And I looked at him, I was like, so technically this could all get denied like right now. And they're like, yeah, pretty much. You just have to make sure you do everything right and follow all the steps and make sure you cross all your T's and dot all your I's and just it's up to you to make sure that that building inspector shows up, the fire department shows up, AGLC, health and safety shows up and they go, okay, this can happen. All of this so you can dance. <laughs> like, can we give them all a hand, please? <laughs> and I say dance, but within all these festivals, there are many uh, components beyond merely dancing and music, as important as they are. Uh, continuing down the line, uh, key green lights, um, yeah. And okay. How far is planning? Well, planning is, is definitely year-round. Um, we, we also have established, you know, goals that are, you know, three and five years ahead. So those types of items are just always in the back of our mind. And then it's, it's sort of a 12-month cycle for the actual logistics of the festival. I would say... Well, Liz and I have a really hard time walking around at the festival and not talking about next year. We have to tell ourselves to stop and enjoy the moment. <laughs> um, but we're just always excited about making things better. And so that's what drives us. Um, the key green lights would be, you know, debriefing after the festival is quite a big process. So like once we are finished our debriefs, um, usually simultaneously our tickets are going on sale for the next year. That's sort of like the first step. And then our next big one would be programming, which generally takes us like four or five months until we have everything really solid. Um, 
And there's a team of people that work on that with me. So that would be the next one. And then um, starting, we because we all live in different towns and we don't have access to the land year round, we have tried many different ways of how we sort of pre-build things. And we, we rent warehouses in Squamish, we rent containers in Merritt, and we have kind of a different approach every year, but that's sort of the next point would be starting building certain things um, and then moving on to site. Um, for Shambhala, pretty much the same thing. Like we work on a 12 month cycle, but uh, we do again have goals that we plan for as part of that too. But um, some things have to be started before the year. So things like tickets, like, you know, artwork, all that kind of stuff had to happen before last year happened so that we were ready to put those tickets out this year. Um, so some of that stuff, those sort of behind the scenes things happen before the year. And then um, when the festival ends, the majority of the departments have to do wrap. Like I'm still wrapping HR and it's like friggin' middle of November. Like it's, I just wanna move on to next year. But um, yeah, but debriefs, like I'm still doing debriefs right now. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah, so and a couple departments are still working on last year and wrapping everything up. Um, and I'm really excited next month to start planning this year with all the info we've gotten. So um, key factors would be, um, well, we have the farm, so that's not, we don't have to worry about that. We just rent that from the family. Um, yeah, just the typical permits, I think. Like we have some weird, we have wastewater permit because we have, we built a wastewater treatment plant on site a couple years ago um, and a water permit because we have free drinking water on site, um, food and beverage, all those outlets need, uh, need to be ticky booed and signed off. Um, what else do we have? I don't know. A lot of per a lot of permits, um, highways because we got to get people in and out of the highway, so we need a permit for that. Um, yeah, there's lots of things that need to be done. <laughs> for Astro Harvest, we are definitely year round as well, um, and much like Andrea said, you're talking about the next year before the first year is over. Um, Green lights, I would say we had a lot more of that sort of stuff in the beginning years when we were establishing everything and we were building relationships with the local communities and um, enforcement agencies and counties and that kind of stuff. Um, now we've pretty much got ourselves set up in an autopilot type of situation where um, you know everyone knows we're gonna be back, everyone knows that this is when it's happening. So now they're almost calling us and just making sure that you know, they should be thinking about us. Um, so we don't have, and I mean, and then it just goes into, you know, once tickets go on sale, that's your main green light. Once you've got some, some tickets flowing out the door, then it's pedaled to the metal and just start booking your artists and planning your stages and everything else. Yeah, go, go time. Uh, Sled Island takes place at the end of June, usually, I would say July, August, are pretty much wrapping up financial, HR, etc. And we usually start working on 2018, yeah, mid-September. Um, we have as much as I would love to start working <laughs> um, earlier than that. Uh, the reality is we're still kind of operating festival to festival. Um, how one given festival is going to do financially is really going to impact how the next one is going to do. So we can't really make any decision before we know how this is going. Uh, we also have a couple of key grants that until we know the result of these, which can really vary from a year to another. Um, we know the festival is going to happen, but that can really quite impact programming usually, or even just the format and the size of the festival. Um, yeah, in terms of things we would do more than a year in advance, the only thing I can think of is one or two specific grants that I have to apply for like two years from now <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, but otherwise it's very much the 10 month leading to the festival. I'm just trying to imagine uh, anticipating and planning for applying and writing down specific information for two years in the future. Yeah. You make it up. That's yeah, how it I works. I was going to say, is that how a lot of that works? <laughs> uh, but you're never in peril. If, you're, if your grant doesn't come in, you're never in full peril. Like, you're never going to disappear because the grant didn't come in. 
I mean, I know. It depends which one, to okay, be honest. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as I'll go with that one. Um, good. Are you planning for growth or maintenance? Uh, you've been growing. Some of you have been growing in the last couple of years. Some of you are at a level, I think. Uh, I think has Shambhala been steady for a little while? Yeah, we've yeah. been capped at 11,000 for a few years, I think. Yep. It used to be 10. Um, but we're still growing, you know, in other ways, growing our brand, growing sure. our, you know, our points of sales and always growing, always looking upward. But, um, but yeah, just not in numbers for sure. Okay. So you're, you're, you've hit your comfortable cap. Yeah. We're comfortable cap now. Like I can't say forever that that's going to be that way, but it's about infrastructure. And so, you know, we look at that and, you know, make sure it has to be right for the for the customers, so um, if we can if we can build infrastructure and make it bigger, then you know maybe we will. Um, but that's infrastructure, and we would need to work on that, and we are not working on that right now. Two hundred and fifty thousand people on the farm. Yeah, I don't think it's that big. No. <laughs> Who wants to take that one next? Growth or maintenance? Where are you headed, and how far ahead I, are you? I looking? would say that for Astro Harvest, we're always working on both. Um, you've got to maintain it. You've got to keep a level of standard that you know that people are used to um, and then you're always kind of looking to grow and when you reach even if you reach a number cap you're gonna like Christine said you're gonna always be looking to grow in other ways right For sorry Nicole <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be Christine okay just recalling emails uh, um, yeah so I would say it's a little bit of both and in, in many ways for us, I would say, I mean, some of the most important growth is the growth nobody sees, the people, the fans, they don't see. Um, growth Aww. Growth for us is, I mean, well, obviously, we're still, we're still growing numbers, and we're uh, kind of organically doing that. But to me, a lot of the measurement of growth comes through just how, you know, dialed everything is getting internally, how well the team is operating, you know, really getting people sunken into roles and responsibilities, developing roles and responsibilities has been one of the most key factors that I've added into our organization in the last couple of years. And it's something that I'm gonna be focusing on more than almost anything because it's it's those people and it's that team that when they have the ability and they know their role and responsibility, that's when they can take something and run with it and you can kind of take that piece out of your head <laughs> and know that they're gonna do that. Um, so that internal growth is so important and just processes and procedures and communication and just like how well uh, admission works and how smoothly people come in and how quickly the lines move at the bar. Those are all things that we're all looking at very closely and working to improve. It's not just numbers on the dance floor, so. Systems, super important systems and procedures in developing those. Did they develop organically? Did you have them right from the start? Not even close. <laughs> you I find even, out I didn't you even need them pretty quick. But then you get to a point a where you can only handle so much, and you're like, ah, I, ha I have to assign this, but I, I can't just like take this and throw it to somebody. I have to build a procedure around it. Otherwise, it's just going to create more work. For it's really, I think it's really valuable for a lot of people to hear that, those kinds of answers, because from the outside, and especially for attending festivals, even playing festivals, it's like, oh, this is like so smooth, and everything's done, and they know what they're doing, and they're up here. And to hear the fact that it's like, I didn't know what I was doing, but now we have systems. It's like, it can give hope to someone who's starting out or thinking of throwing their own event in another region. So thank you for being brave with those answers. Am I right? Is it good to hear that kind of thing? Like, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Okay, good. Um, yeah, you figured right. out really quick. <laughs> you have to, right? You can literally feel like a juggling act behind the scenes. And like, the whole goal is to make it look as clean as possible when everyone shows up. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody? yeah. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Sure, well, we've also been trying to find the balancing act between growing our capacity and, and growing our internal team. Um, for us, the capacity, we set our own cap each year, and that's because we're really trying to, to maintain the, the intimate sort of feel of Base Coast, and so we just have to feel it out each year. and. You know, this year we have grown again. I can't say we're going to grow again next year. We'll have to see what happens. Um, but we do need to develop our internal team, and that's what we've really been focusing on the last two years. Like, our, our number of paid staff have really increased. And so, 
you've got to find that balance of being able to support the development that you need and also maintain the quality of event. Um, so that's kind of our main our main focus. And as far as the systems go, we're, we love systems. So we're always trying to implement them, but it's also trial and error and also creating an organizational chart, like who reports to who, that changes every year as, as you've got more people. And so I, I'm always really interested to see how other people structure their events because there's no guidebook. <laughs> it's like everybody seems to be feeling it out themselves. Could the five of one. you write one? <laughs> Could the five of you write a guidebook on a Google Doc? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> Yay, it's happening up here too. Um, I'm going to modify that question a little bit. Do systems that maybe you've had for a couple of years, do they ever codify? And do you think that ever takes away from uh, renewed creativity? But sounds like, oh, this is the way we do it now. Or do you give people freedom? I think it's, it can become bad to a certain extent uh, to always rely on, well, that's the way we've been doing it, so let's just stick with that. I think that, uh, yeah, a few times it definitely like work against us, and it's good sometimes. And I feel like for this to be pointed out, you usually just need new blood and people looking at the way you're doing things and questioning it. And then you realize that, oh, it's true. Maybe it's not the most <laughs> efficient way to do something. So as much as it's really great to develop process where there were none and being more organized, I think that's something we all strive to do. I think it's also good to, you know, reevaluate from time to time and look at and just question yourself, why are we doing this like that? Or like have things changed in the industry that we could be doing it differently? Um, yeah. It's hard to put a process around creativity too. So uh, every year, you know, sitting around coming up with new ideas, every new idea, you're not gonna go and write a whole new guidebook on how to do this new thing. So, if, you know, you come up with an idea and you figure it out and if it sticks, then maybe you develop a process around that. But uh, you know, that's got to just be free flow and let the ideas go. And at the same time, uh, technology changes and things evolve and ideas change in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So you might come up with a great system with some sort of online festival management software and then all of a sudden something better comes out. And so now you need to build all new systems and develop new ways to do things as well. Um, yeah, so it's ever changing and, and like Maud said, when people come in and have better ideas, be open to them because that's what's going to improve things. Don't just cross your arms and say, we've done that forever. In your, uh, in uh, delivering the festival, who are like the maybe one to three key partners? And that could be uh, landholders or it could be the city or it could be who or a, a sponsor or uh, maybe it's booking agents. But who are the three, the one to three key partners that you work with? Um, with us, because we move around to different land locations, um, this, we, the first couple of years was on city land, and so we work very closely with the city, um, which actually was a huge benefit for anyone who wants to plan a festival. Do it on city land the first time. You'll get assigned a city liaison who will be there to walk you through every step, and they will be on your ass to make sure you have every permit. And that helped me out so much, and it was a huge learning experience when I went to a private land because all of a sudden I was on my own and I was like, do I have all the permits I need? When was this one due? How long out does this one need to be submitted? And luckily I had done two years on city land and had worked really closely with the city. So they were, they were key for that in my learning. Um, so the city was great. You'll have to jump through a thousand more hoops than you would on private land, but you'll learn a lot. Um, and then land partners and then the two other organizations involved, they're like amazing business people that I look up to. They're my mentors, Jim Button from Village Brewery and James Wetcher from Fiasco and YYC Food Trucks. They're, they're um, huge mentors of mine, but also great brains. So business, creativity, uh, the three of us get together and, and uh, really make the magic happen. Um, Base Coast originally started in Squamish, so it was outside the city limits and in the district the Squamish Lillooet Regional District. And so when we started, there wasn't really an event application. Um, it was really just going and asking a ton of questions and trying to figure out really what they need and nobody was guiding us. So it, we found it very 
vague. Um, and luckily we, you know, we asked other event organizers who had worked in the district for their advice. And so people were very helpful in sharing their experience. Um, and then when we moved to Merritt, our land straddles the city and the district. So we kind of have to work with both. And they're very supportive of us and kind of help straddle the permitting needs of both. Um, but working within the city, we found that there's like a checklist and things are laid out a little bit better. Whereas the district, again, this is a different district, but doesn't have a clear checklist. Um, so, so those would be sort of some of the key people we work with. And then the caretaker of the land, um, he is so valuable, <laughs> just knowing large properties and how to deal with everything from like the fire suppression system and the roads and fixing the buildings. Like he is very important to our team. Um, and then also the booking agents, like de continually developing those relationships. It just makes the conversation so much easier um, when you can call someone up that you've, you've already kind of explained like what the festival is or better yet they've come to the festival and, and understand sort of what our musical aesthetic is and it's, it helps both, I think, the agent and the festival to, to find the right acts. Um, I think our key partnership for Shambhala would be the Bun Shoes, um, which are Jimmy's parents who own the land that he, he's had the festival on since day one, um, 21 years ago. Um, so they would be the key, key, key partner. Um, I'd say I'd give a big shout out to PK Sound because they've been with us for quite a lot, a long time. Yeah. Bring in the bass. Um, they're, right, they're right here. Yeah, you're hearing them. <laughs> I don't think we sound as bassy though. Um, but yeah, so I'd say they're a pretty, uh, a pretty big partner for us. Uh, we love them. Um, and hmm. I don't know, like some long-standing partnerships. I don't know if they're the most important, but um, like Megan Hildebrandt, who does our artwork for the festival, um, we work closely with her every year. She comes up, she paints a painting, um, which turns into the ticket that, that we have. And all, actually, all those paintings hang uh, in our other business, the Savoy Hotel that's opening up, um, in the restaurant all the tickets are from all the years, the actual painting that the tickets are based on are in there, it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so she makes these paintings and um, and then they turn into tickets, we send them out to Raja down at uh, Laser Guided Visions, I think it's in California. Um, and he makes those dope like holographic tickets that everyone loves, so um, I'd say those are key partners. I'm not, you know, they're pretty cool partners to have. I would say our, our main partner is um, the landowners, the Lesser Slave Lake North Country Community Association. And uh, we've built a great relationship and connection with them over the years. Um, but without them, we wouldn't be in that spot and we wouldn't have been able to get started um, in the way that we did. And um, they've supported us in many different ways um, throughout our growth. And it's become a get, bit of a give and take relationship as well. So uh, they have a, a festival that's held two weeks before us. And um, so we've been able to actually provide something back over the years. And so um, it's worked out well. And uh, that's our main, I mean, we build relationships with agents, we build relationships with stage managers and stage developers. Um, you know, there's there's tons and tons of different connections that you're building with people uh, throughout the process. Can I just butt in? Sorry, I have one more. Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't mention before, but I think one of our key partnerships as well um, are our stage directors who curate and build our stages. Like pretty much, we would be nothing without them. Um, they book all the talent. They build all those crazy stages in the forest, and uh, yeah, so key partnership. Uh, in our case, since we're not an outdoor festival, but multi-venue. <laughs> Sorry. That's, yeah, that's not PK. That <laughs> Live Glitch Hop <laughs> Remix. Uh, definitely the main main partnerships that are important are just with all of our venues. Uh, they're championing the festival. They're 
they're really not just like location where we bring our stuff and the festival happens. They're really involved in like how this is all developed, whether it's like talking about programming or like they help us with our beer sponsor, liquor sponsor. They're really doing everything they can to make the festival successful. And obviously at the end of the day, the more the festival is successful, they're successful as well. But it really feels like, yeah, it's a, it's a real true partnership between them. Uh, and the festival. Um, the second one, I, I would, I have to say, our funders, whether they're like public funders or private sponsors, we have way more public <laughs> partners than private sponsors, but we still do. Um, simply because without this money, there wouldn't be a festival, and it's really as simple as that. So we really have to to maintain these relationships. Uh, and Lester would say suppliers as well, um, whether it's like for all the sound system we rent. Equipment, uh, our main hotel partner, the firm on Palliser, that is awesome. It's really great to bring sometimes really small bands uh, who are used to be treated not necessarily super well, and you put them up at the Palliser Hotel as like a four or five star hotel, and like they're like just chilling with all those businessmen in suits, and it's a, it's really awesome, awesome experience for everyone. It's hard to choose one most important relationship sure. because There's so I many, think. Right? It has to be this balance of every single person is val is like a part of the puzzle. Well, if there's any quick Definitely. shout outs anybody needs to make, <laughs> go ahead and do it. Yeah. Uh, um, what's, the, what's the greatest, maybe in the last three to five years, what's the greatest challenge you've experienced as a festival? And how did you overcome it? How did you work through it? What was that process? Be it with a partner like you've just been describing, be it bringing artists in or their visas not, getting, not coming through, or be it with the environment which is, seems to be a changing factor in our outdoor festivals. Um, what's the biggest challenge you've experienced? And how did you get through it? Because we want people to learn. It's hard to choose just one. <laughs> Pick one. I mean, just this last year alone, I was crawling into bed at 3 a.m. on the day before, the, or two days before the festival, main day of setup, and I got a text from OPO's manager, our headliner, and his grandfather passed away, and he wasn't getting on his flight from Australia. Um, that just shakes things up so huge when you're two days out and you need to be focusing on organizing your team to build a festival and I spent the next 12 hours on the phone working with agents around the world to like get somebody on a plane and, and get them here and and we did good we got manic focus on a plane and got them here and replaced it which people thought some people thought was an upgrade people were stoked <laughs> I mean uh, the day of the festival we got denied our permit to our noise exemption permit to go to 11. So not only did we work our ass off to get that replacement, but that time slot we no longer had. So. <laughs> what? That's awesome. What? So our entire team is literally working around the clock and pulling five minutes from this person set and 10 minutes from this person set and 15 minutes from this person set. But not only are you cutting those times, you're getting in contact with every agent and every performer and every stage manager and everyone. Not only that, but we had to update the website, create new artwork. We had to reprint our, our, our um, we had handbills with all the schedules. And this is all happening overnight from midnight till about four in the morning. Our team, it was just like, it was at that moment, I was so proud of our team and the, and the people who were in the roles and responsibilities that they had because our social media manager was up in, updating social media, our graphic designer was updating the graphics, our uh, web designer was updating the website, our talent manager was updating all the agents, and our stage manager was updating the backline requirements and all of that stuff. And this was literally happening overnight the day before the festival. So, I mean, that, that was just, you know, and those are little things that probably most people didn't even really see. I mean, other than the you know the name change, but uh, and that's one of, of of many many things that happens. So, like I said, it's hard to pick one. But the the biggest thing is, don't worry about the why or what or whatever. Just find the solution. Like the number one thing is, I don't care who you are, what you what you think. The most important thing is to find the solution because there. I will always say there is a solution to every single problem. I don't care how hard or how big it is, find the best one, the most effective one, the most cost effective, and the one that's gonna make the festival go on as smoothly as possible. So find the solution. All that so you can dance. <laughs> what about you? Um, well, our biggest challenge was definitely when we lost our site in Squamish and we had to search for somewhere new. Um, we had a huge list of criteria, you know, being 
within an hour and a half of an airport, within an hour of a hospital, somewhere really beautiful um, that inspires people, somewhere with water, somewhere where we're not annoying the neighbors. <laughs> um, and so we had to search long and hard and really we feel very fortunate that we found where we are now. Um, so our first fest year at the festival brought another really big surprise challenge when we had PK sound for our first time. We were really excited about our main stage sound and we built everything and loaded it in and we're ready for sound check. And this stage is a pre-existing stage. So um, it was from the former country music festival that was there. And as soon as PK turned on the sound, the whole barn started rattling so loud, you could not hear anything. We all came running from all different corners of the site going like, oh my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> And so, you know, there, it was, I think, quarter to 5 p.m. on the Thursday, gates open the next morning. And so our build team just like quickly ran to the store, bought as much plywood as possible, got up on the roof, tore all the, the metal off the roof, replaced it with plywood overnight. We t plugged it in in the morning, turned it on, and thankfully the buzz was gone and the show could continue, but it was terrifying. <laughs> It, I, I'm getting the sense that, uh, to use impolite language, the key skill or the key attitude or asset to the team is just get shit done. 100%. And, and finding yeah. those people and collecting them. Yeah, True? find the solution. Number it's never skill. a no. Number one skill, problem yeah. solving. Okay. <laughs> get her done. Shambhala. Hmm. Well, do you want to talk about this summer? <laughs> Not really. Okay. <laughs> We don't have to. We can skip over that uh, one. Uh, yeah. I think it, it is. It, I, I want to push on that one because yeah, because the environment is changing and we're outdoor <laughs> festivals and all that stuff, and we have to take that into account. I think in planning and all that, but we don't want to cover it. It's totally fine. No, no. I, I I'll touch on it because I assume that that probably would be the. It was this year was probably the hardest, Shambhala for our team for sure with the wildfires. Um, we monitored those fires like for a month. Um, when we moved on site, and uh, yeah, and one got close, so um, a whole bunch of crazy debacle, but um, yeah, we had a lot of meetings. We had like a billion artists on hold, like in the airport, we're like meeting, we're like, we need to make a decision, this guy is does not know whether he should get on his plane or not, like, yeah, it was crazy, and it's just so, because we decided to reopen, um, because I don't know if you guys know, we canceled the festival or had an early closure um, on Saturday so that we would everyone would leave on Sunday. Um, and we made that call, like not lightly, um, but based on a lot of information that we were given, we were with speaking with all the authorities throughout the whole thing. Um, but two things, I think some of the information, you know, wasn't 100% accurate. Um, and secondly, I think things changed, the fire changed, direction changed. We brought in like fire analysts, um, like our office was just like an insane amount of like meetings and officials and just coming in and out. It was a crazy day. Um, but yeah, in the end, um, it was deemed safe that we could continue the festival. So we did that, pissed some people off, that made some people really freaking happy. Um, but but yeah, it did, it's something you can't help. It happens in the moment. You got to deal with it in the moment and figure it out. And uh, and yeah, we did the best we could. We still put on a great party. That's that's all Jimmy cares about is just wants us to have a great party. So um, so so we did. And I hope there's no more fires. <laughs> Has that changed disaster or crisis planning for future years? And is is everyone else looking yep. at disaster and crisis planning with with these things starting to happen? Yeah, it's part we, of your planning process. We have a huge like public safety, all that kind of pretty dialed. But um, but yeah, I think the communication is one of the things we're going to work on this year. Like, I mean, we went crazy like right out on the app. We had people with handbills. We like set up teams to go from camp to camp, you know, to get the word out. Um, but yeah, I want to maybe get a staff app or something so we can get everything to the staff quicker because the staff, you know it took a long time to disseminate that information down to every um, staff and volunteer, and I would have liked to do that quicker, so that's my fault, probably, but it'll, I it'll will be, do it better this year. It'll, yeah, it'll <laughs> be great this year. Yeah. Uh, stumbling blocks, challenges, and how you overcame them in our last couple minutes. 2011, we, about a week out of the event, we had the land completely underwater. We had a flood come in, um, and it wiped out 
uh, most of the roads, wiped out a bunch of infrastructure, wiped out pretty much everything you need to throw the event. And we, so I, I drove up, I got the phone call, and I drove up to the land at record speed. And we basically decided at that point that we weren't going to be able to throw the event in the state that the land was in. Um, so we made a post online and said that we have a week before, you know, things need to, I th actually, I think it was a week before we were going to be up there, so it was two weeks before the event. We said, we have a week before we can decide whether or not this is going to happen um, fully. Uh, we basically needed a lot of sunshine, so we asked everybody to ask for sunshine, and we got, like, five days of, like, nothing but plus 30. And it dried up, I would say, 80% of the water. Wait, wait, you have a sunshine team? We have a sunshine team. So and we just, we just, any of these people need sunshine for the weekend? One post, can... one post <laughs> online, one week of sunshine. It's expensive too. I like this guy. <laughs> and, and without that sun actually, and without that water drying up as fast as it could, we probably wouldn't have thrown it that year. Um, but once we got on the land, we were faced with a ton of challenges. We had to rebuild roads. We had to... Uh, stake off areas, all the camping along the river wasn't allowed, so everybody kind of had to, got really cozy that year because all the camping space kind of got a lot more um, tight. And uh, yeah, that was definitely our most challenging year uh, in that sense. Um, but you do face a lot of other challenges that some of you wouldn't tell anybody about. And, and uh, yeah, you kind of just, you go with the flow and like, like everyone said, you just you find a solution, you don't worry about what happened. And if anybody really needs to dish, uh, go for it. No, I don't think anybody's going to take up on that right now. Uh, biggest challenge in the last couple of years, how you got around it? Um, well, we did have our share of natural disaster a long time ago, 2013, with the Calgary flood that happened right in the middle of Sled Island, and we were forced to cancel. So I guess we all have that in common. <laughs> Uh, but over the past two to three years, I would say that one of the main challenges has been the American dollar being so much stronger than the Canadian dollar. Uh, and why is that? So uh, a lot of our headliners are international acts that are demanded to be paid in U.S. dollar. Uh, even if you go back to like 2014, I think the dollar was still on par. So for one Canadian dollar was equal one USD. Now it's closer to 1.3, which means that to book the exact same festival, it cost us something like close to $100,000 extra. Uh, it's, and it's not like you can just up the ticket price uh, like to make up for it, especially not with like the economical state of Alberta uh, in the past couple of years as well. So I actually don't have a solution yet. <laughs> I'm just bringing up the issue, but like, to be honest, we're still working on adapting our budget and business model because that might be our reality for like a long time to come. There's no way to tell. Sure. Uh, so it's really adapting your budget and trying to make do with even less than you had to begin with. Um, I didn't want to drag us all into despair by asking these questions. I wanted to show both <laughs> strategies for getting through it. No, no, and that wasn't in response to you. Uh, but... Um, but I think there's a lot of learning that can happen with, with all of these things and to be vulnerable enough to share the challenges and not just the rah, rah, rah of yeah. peak time when, I don't know, whoever it is is, is on the main stage, <laughs> which is the great times. Uh, but also I think it's really important to give a snapshot to a lot of people into your experience uh, and what it really takes to do this. So thank you for being willing to discuss that. We're going to go a couple minutes over for Q&A. Uh, and I have one last question that I really have to get in here. I have a bunch more, and I wish we had a two-hour panel because we have so much great, uh, incredible knowledge with all of you. Um, but the last one for me is um, how important is and how do you and who do you partner with if you do uh, communicate, address, and mitigate um, harm reduction sexual harassment and consent culture, how is this addressed within your organization and your, and your festival? This is perhaps a long question, but maybe there's an answer that you've already thought of. I mean, for, for us, we, we're a very small festival that started four years ago, and, and you know, we started with a couple nurses on site, and then first aid and, and EMS, and, and even growing to having an ambulance on site was a big deal for us. And so these are new, kind of topics and things that we're starting to kind of dive more into and work with local groups to facilitate 
and kind of bring to the surface and in, in, embed into our communication. And those are things we're kind of currently working on to kind of develop as we continue to grow. Cool. Anyone have some resources they want to toss Aaron's way? Well, Stacey Forrester is our harm reduction um, coordinator, and she's incredibly passionate and very educated in all things harm reduction. Um, so she, when she took over our program, she really designed it again from scratch and focused on, you know, the the drug aspect, um, consent, assault, um, mental health, and and just general knowledge. So we kind of break ours into educating people before they get to site. And we've been focusing over the last two years on finding fun ways of getting people to just to be thinking and talking about harm reduction through videos, um, you know, infographics online that are like interesting and, and cool and, and contests. Um, and then once on site, we have like a really wonderful harm reduction team. And we actually introduced an app two years ago, which has played a big role in our harm reduction because we have a like a call or a text number on there. If you're in an emergency, any kind, you can you can do that and it'll go to our dispatch and, and help um, bring the correct resource to your exact location. Um, so what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. Like can we implement that everywhere? Yeah, I mean it's iPhones are great because you act. They have your latitude and longitude on there, so you can pinpoint where people are. They're tracking you. Y yeah, <laughs> but it's really helpful in emergency yeah. situations. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's sort of our biggest new addition to our harm reduction. But every year we're we're trying to involve the community ahead of time. So it's like an all year attempt at preventing things from happening, and then having a strong response plan. Uh, just a shout out to Stacy, uh, her organization in Vancouver called Good Night Out Vancouver. She runs with Ashton. Uh, Groundwork works with them at our events to, to mitigate uh, harm reduction and harassment. Uh, they're awesome. If anybody's in Vancouver or needs resources, talk to them. At Shambhala, our harm reduction director's name is Stacy too. Different Stacy, but and equally as lovely. Um, so she heads the whole harm reduction team, um, which is we break down into six different departments that are all staffed, um, which kind of I think started with the sanctuary, um, which is kind of a chilled out. If, I don't know how many people have been to Shambhala. Quite a few. So you might some of you may have seen the sanctuary, um, but yeah, a place to go when you're overwhelmed or you just need to like check out and sleep or drink a juice box or whatever. Um, so th those are staffed um, 24 hours a day. We also have a women's safe space, um, and the whole consent is sexy. Is I mean, it, it's all over the site. We've got in porta potties, pretty much everywhere. Um, we have anchors who does the um, substance testing and awareness. Uh, we have a camp clean beats for people who um, wish to not partake um, in drugs and alcohol, and they have meetings there, and they all have their own camp. Um, like twice a day meetings. Um, we have outreach team that go around the site, kind of making sure everybody's okay, giving out information. Um, we kind of do the creep watch. They do the creep watch, make sure nothing's going down. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting one of them. If that was six, I got them all. Um, if it wasn't, there's one more. Um, and yeah, and so we have like hundreds of volunteers and a few pay people too that work on that team and we feel pretty proud of where we're at. I think we kind of bridged that a long time ago and we've really been strong on that's a really important thing to us. Um, so yeah, we try to educate online as well like before the show and uh, just try to have as many people out there and everybody, you know, Shambhala is kind of like a family. We call it the family. Um, so, you know, we see people looking out for each other there and, and that's awesome and we want to kind of promote that and, and that be the thing. But you know, in the event that that's not happening, we're there. We've got teams prepared to make sure that that happens the best it can. Um, yeah, and we like last year. I think we bought. I want to say 800, but I really don't. I can't. Don't quote me on that. I hope you're not videotaping that. Um, but but we did buy hundreds of naloxone kits last year and trained all our staff um, and even guests. Um, and there wasn't one documented use of it. 
which was awesome, because the two things we were really worried about this year were fires and fentanyl. And well, the fire didn't quite work out how we wanted, but the fentanyl did, because we didn't have to use one. Congrats. Yeah. For us, uh, it's pretty much the same approach as Shambhala and Base Coast. We have uh, a highly skilled team that is quite versed in harm reduction, and they've, they're very passionate, and they, they know what they're doing, and they care a lot about what they're, what they're bringing to the table. And it's, um, it's a really important aspect to have in any festival. It doesn't matter what size you are, um, especially in this specific industry. And so we have, yeah, we have on-site um, harm reduction and testing and uh, we incorporate, we have a really close relationship between our EMS, our on-site security and our harm reduction. So they're all on the same radio channel. They all talk to each other. They all know each other well and they know the way each other works um, because you can't have that separation to have flow. Um, and... Yeah, we, we try to do a lot of pre-festival educating as well, do online posts, do you know social media representation of harm reduction, and then as well just create um, you know different avenues on site that let people know that that service and and re those resources are available. Um, make sure your security is visible. Make sure um, you know we have roamers that go around. Uh, the campground, and they're just looking for people that might be, you know, sleeping in a chair by a fire, and they could possibly fall into it. You know, everything from, you know, harm reduction includes everything. It's just, it's about making sure that everybody's safe. Um, yeah, and we take it very seriously. How is managing that over multiple venues in the city? Um, so in our case, uh, especially last year, we started really focusing uh, primarily on uh, trying to address issues related to sexual harassment and consent. Uh, we started a really awesome partnership with the Calgary Sexual Health Center. They, uh, they have a large campaign to raise awareness around these issues right now and they are offering a bystander training. So we had all of our staff attend the training. We also made it mandatory for our volunteer venue managers. Uh, we are encouraging all of our venues to have their own staff take the training and I know Quite a few of them have by now, which is really awesome. Um, and then they also, the Calgary Sexual Health Center also has been offering this same training to anyone who wants to during the festival, so open to all attendees and artists. Um, and as far as during the event, so we've always taken the approach that we, we are not experts in this area and we didn't really feel comfortable with trying to create, or we don't even have the human resources, quite frankly, to, to take those issues on ourselves. So the Calgary Sexual Health Center gave us a, um, a series of like phone number, crisis line, uh, all the resources that already exist, but that people are not necessarily aware of. And so we've made those phone numbers available uh, not only on our website, but also we have those signs that we put directly inside the venues. Uh, and we also have signs inside venues that tell attendees that if anything's happened either to them or if they're witnessing anything, they should find our venue manager who then can even find them a phone. Or we also try to provide uh, safe rooms, kind of like the same idea as the lounge that you have if someone feels like they need some privacy, so some venues are able to accommodate that. Um, but yeah, we try to have at least something to offer to people who are feeling distressed and trying to put them in touch as soon as possible with people who are professional in this field. I think I forgot actually two yep. Yep. <laughs> departments. So can we do well, it super quick? Yeah, yeah awesome. just options for sexual health, which Pretty yeah, big we there. have them as well. Yeah, and women's safe space. I can't remember if I said that, but we have a self-identified women's safe space as well. Cool. Um, who here has volunteered for a festival in the past? Yeah, right. Can we give a hand to our volunteers? Like, how are yeah. they? And to all of you. Um, we, we've gone over time. Thank you for your patience. And if you need to get somewhere, I totally understand. I'm going to do like one question, and I'm sure these are wonderful people. If you want to ask them something, uh, you can approach them and, and ask them a question. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to, to chat with you. 
Uh, but I'd really just like to start, before we get to that question, just, just give a really big hand to our five panelists up here. Thank you so much, both for, both for being here today and being willing to have this uh, conversation and sit down, but also for what you do. Because I know it takes a lot. Clearly, it takes a lot. Uh, and so thank you for doing that. I have one question I saw a hand up way at the back. So this is going to be our one question on the mic. I'm going to repeat it on the mic, so speak up real loud. What was your biggest challenge in the first year? Real quick. <laughs> Funding, selling tickets. Funding. Oh, uh, tickets. I'm going to follow up on that. Is is are tickets like a huge component of your cash flow, and does that dictate Definitely. when they yes. go on sale? Okay, good. Good to know. Good for us to know. Okay, first in the first year. Same thing. Our 100% funded by tickets. Thought we'd get a thousand people. Got 400. So you know, that has a big effect. <laughs> okay, so how many years until you were kind of standing on? on stable ground? The fourth year, but yeah, then we okay. moved in our fifth year, so it started right. again. Okay. <laughs> first challenges in the first year? For us, it would be finding the venue. But uh, I did a little strategy of my own that I think made it just happen was we just booked our first act from Europe before we had a venue, <laughs> and then it just made us have to find one. Sometimes you gotta put yourself on the hook, right? <laughs> yeah, put the, cart, put the cart before the horse, <laughs> and then it... First year challenges? I wasn't involved in year one, so I can't really. What was the biggest challenge in your first year? The flood. The flood. <laughs> no, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> you walked right into the Bow River flood. <laughs> Woo. I don't know. It was 21 years ago. It was 21 years ago. <laughs> well, I remember Jimmy in high school because we sat next to each other. What's uh, that? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there were. That was a challenge. I'm sure okay. that. Yeah. I'm sure Kidding. there were problems back then, but, uh, you know, I think he was just trying to throw it. I don't think he, well, I don't know that he had visions of this. I think he was just throwing a party for his buds. Yeah. So it's amazing what every you're thinking right now can turn into with this amount of work and the get shit done attitude. Okay. Mode from Sled Island. And we have Nicole from Shambhala. I'm skipping. And Baron from Circle and Bass Bus. And Jordan from Astral Harvest. And Andrea from Bass Coast. Let's give them a big hand.